Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's presentation of Five Hours to France in a Bonanza using the Aeronav 800-900 navigators from Bendix King. My name is Jeff Simon. I'm president of Social Flight. For those of you joining us for the first time, Social Flight is the free web and mobile app dedicated to supporting general aviation. Visit socialflight.com or download the Social Flight mobile app for Apple and Android devices, and that will give you free access to over 10 thousand aviation events, destinations, and airport restaurants. You'll even get a weekly email with a list of all the aviation events happening in your local area. Our mission is to give pilots like yourselves more reasons to get out there and fly. Now, in addition to events that you can fly to, we also have online events, which is why we're all here today. One of Social Flight's partners is Bendix King, who recently introduced the Aeronav 800 and 900 navigators, which are their version of the Avidyne IFD series of navigators. I've been a fan of these navigators for years, and I am very excited to see them migrate into Bendix King's strategy for integration with their complete AeroView avionics panel strategy. They are definitely some amazing things coming for this technology. Um, it's really going to be interesting to see as it evolves and all these pieces come together in a comprehensive panel with the vision of uh, Bendix King. Today we're here to talk about our adventure as well as how we use these devices to repair and navigate, navigate en route. Um, hopefully there'll be some great takeaways as to uh, how you can do this adventure for yourself or how you can apply some of this to a uh, different adventure using some of the same principles. Before we get started, here's a few tips. First of all, a recording of today's presentation will be available on socialflight.com and on our YouTube channel. Simply search for Social Flight on YouTube, one word, Social Flight, and uh, it usually takes about 24 hours before that is available, and you also get a link by email after this presentation. Now, during the presentation, feel free to post questions. There is a Q&A feature in there. I'll try to answer some of those during the presentation or fit them into the presentation, um, or we'll uh, ask, uh, take on some of them at the end if uh, there are, are some remaining questions there as well. So let's get started. Now, uh, first of all, quick little thing about myself, uh, in case uh, you're not at all familiar, who your speaker is. Um, I've uh, been involved in aviation now for a very long time, uh, AMP and IA mechanic. I've been in the avionics industry for more than 20 years, pilot aircraft owner, and I'm also the maintenance columnist for AOPA Online. I am very, very vested in uh, teaching people, having them learn more about their aircraft, about flying, and mostly about promoting general aviation and making it as accessible as possible to as many people as possible. I also have experience with the FASTC and PMA product uh, uh, strategy. Uh, I uh, created extended baggage for Beechcraft and also a product called the FlexAlert Multifunction Enunciator. And of course, most and dear to my heart is the um, free social flight app that we talked about because that really is the key to getting people out there and flying and finding their own adventures. And one little tidbit, if I were to look behind me right now in my home, I would see the uh, project coming together of a T-51D Mustang in our living room and dining room. But that is a story for another time. I would like now also to introduce Stephen Pierce. Stephen uh, is uh, a UND graduate with major in aviation technology. Stephen, how are you doing? Doing very well. Thank you so much for that, Jeff. Um, yeah, so as he said, a UND graduate, major in aviation technology management, um, passion about aviation in general. Uh, and I do hold engine instrument rating, which I do not use as much as I want to be using, but I'm starting to get back on the multi-engine train um, to continue to work on uh, some proficiency there. Um, also, a big part of what I do as uh, Benix King is my presence on the online forums. Uh, so if you've interacted with Benix King at all uh, via Beach Talk or Pilots of America or Mooney Space or Piper Form, anything there, you've most likely talked to me. Um, and so if you do have any questions specific to the Aeronav products that we talk about today, uh, and you think that they would be best written um, somewhere where a lot of people can see them, uh, or it might be a question other people have, feel free to enter that on the forms. Uh, we're definitely looking for engagement there, and I would love to just talk with any and all of you um, out there. So uh, let me know. Uh, but apart from that, that's a, a good sense of kind of what I do. 
So I am the uh, marketing manager for Benix King uh, for uh, the AeroView products, um, but I will be kind of covering the basics of the uh, AeroNav products and kind of walking you through some of the great features and benefits of having those in your cockpit. Excellent. Thanks so much, Stephen. So let's get started and let's start with the first thing of all. Okay, so we are talking about going to France uh, and what it turns out is that, you know, I had heard uh, uh, about a year and a half ago about that something from someone that there were islands that were off the uh, coast of Newfoundland uh, that are uh, still actually uh, technically and legally part of France. And as I started to look into this uh, uh, in more detail, I found something that really uh, I found to be absolutely amazing. And that is that these two islands of Saint-Pierre and Miquelon uh, are to France the same thing that Hawaii is uh, to us, meaning not a, not a protectorate, not uh, just something that, that is a territory or something like the like when we look at the Virgin Islands and places like that, but actually your passport is stamped France. It is part of the EU, all of the things that go along with that. And so the more we looked into it, the more amazing this was, the more we dug into it and the more there was to find in terms of both adventure and fascinating history. And so we set off for this to, to figure out how we could plan this adventure. Five hours to the French islands of Saint-Pierre and Miquelon, three countries, two overwater crossings and one great adventure. And that was our mission going into this. And so let's uh, take a look into that a little bit here. Okay, first of all, uh, it just, it, it, you can't even get started on this without actually looking into what some of the history is because it is absolutely fascinating. I happen to love history and, and yet I had absolutely no idea about this at all. You can see in the image there in the upper right hand corner where this is actually located. Um, and yet, um, such significance in our history, but but I had no idea about any of it. So if we go back between 1670 and 1815, these two islands, which were uh, absolutely uh, coveted uh, between Great Britain and France due to the only deep water port in that area uh, and the most some of the most amazing fishing access into the St. Lawrence Seaway, all of these critical things in this area caused this to be a uh, these two islands to be subject of a lot of back and forth um, and so there's actually some remarkable history of how they changed hands back and forth until 1815 where they actually go and finally become part of France one of the things that's really fascinating if you either go there or decide to research into it is that in 1903 we almost purchased it and uh, it, uh, these islands almost became a part of the United States. And literally, it was simply uh, uh, shelved when there was uh, a, 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 the uh, election and the change in government. And basically, the priorities just changed with this changing of the congressmen and presidents at the time. So fascinating big changes. Well, what happened next? 1920 to 1933, prohibition happened. And during uh, that that time period, um, what happened is literally uh, Al Capone's entire kind of organization uh, moved a lot of operations to Saint Pierre in particular because this being a legal part of France at this point skirted all sorts of rules, regulations, and oversight because we weren't worried about things uh, with uh, everybody that was trying to uh, look at how things were being imported. Coming from Canada into the United States, this had the appearance of things coming all the way from Europe and totally different rules and, and, and oversight that was happening around it, and yet it was right off of our shore. So it became and the entire economy. Uh, of Saint Pierre and Miquelon turns over into the bootleg industry. That runs everything until, of course, prohibition ends. And uh, during uh, uh, once that happens, everything crashes, everything changes in this air until another big change happens. That big change happened in 1940, one when France uh, when France fell uh, to the Germans at the beginning of World War II. These islands 
were surrendered as well. And so this became one of the most important and most significant things that occurred in more recent history, because what happened during this time off these two islands, especially Saint-Pierre because of its deep water port that it had right there, was that when this fell uh, and uh, to Nazi Germany, they began to militarize it and use it to run U-boats. And these U-boats patrolled all off the coast of uh, the United States, especially, of course, in New England, and were absolutely critical in attacking the uh, merchant uh, marine uh, uh, vessel and the convoys that were coming out of the St. Lawrence uh, Seaway, uh, supplying Great Britain and keeping Great Britain alive during this key uh, part of our history. And yet all of this was being run directly from these islands. Really fascinating stuff. Well, what happens in this is there at this time was still a lot going on that was keeping America out of the war and keeping America from doing anything about this particular uh, threat. And that actually ended when Charles de Gaulle on Christmas Eve of 1941 went in and liberated it in a without a shot being fired, but with troops coming in and everything to take over Saint Pierre and Miquelon on Christmas Eve, 1941. From that point forward, after the war, it became fishing and tourism, and what we have today, a cultural center that is truly uh, uh, the, the same as if you were directly in, uh, you know, outside Paris, as it would be. So a little bit of history, but I wanted to give you a sense of what this really is, because it is such a fascinating place to actually go to. So let's take a look at where it is. Um, we are coming from outside the Boston area, and if you see that, our trip takes us all the way up to the edge of Maine, across, you go through uh, just south of Prince Edward Island and across Nova Scotia, and uh, then you get to these two tiny little islands that are up uh, near uh, Newfoundland there. So really interesting as far as this is what it looks like if you're looking at just the kind of topographic map. Well, we don't care much about topographic maps usually when we're flight planning. So if we take a look at this from a flight planning perspective, this is what it looks like. So when it's time to plan your trip and you decide to go and, and, and look at what it would be like to go to this and you pull up, the most of the charts or free charting services or your your average electronic flight bag that you're looking at, it's uh, going to have lots of information until you get about three quarters of the way there, and um, and then you get to go into the great unknown beyond there. So that's not really helpful, and that creates some very significant issues in terms of flight planning. Now, here is a really cool answer to that to also consider. Um, flightplan.com and flightplan.go in particular. So there's an app, F-L-T-P-L-A-N, flightplan.go or P-L-N, flightplan.go. Um, this just happens to have free access to the charts and the aeronautical data that most of the aeronautical data at least that you need in order to be able to make this trip. Now, Key point here is that it creates, it gives you most of the information. Well, fortunately, it gives you some of the information that you need in terms of the Canadian portion. Remember that we actually are traversing from, we need United States data, we need Canadian data, and we actually then need data, which I'll talk about in a minute, that is actually French aeronautical data. And so this at least gets us part of the way and gets us the larger area charts. Um, and uh, an interesting thing to note here, uh, when we zoomed in on some of these, you can kind of barely make it out on this view. We don't have a, a live way of showing you all of this right now. But if you uh, look uh, on the left-hand side of this map and a little bit north, you see that the difference between being south and the Atlantic Ocean and north is that there's a, there's a texture on the oceanographic side. And as we researched what all of this was, it, it really uh, goes and, and cements the, the information about really where you are and what you're going. Because what that represents is the extent of pack ice in the winter. These charts literally show you where the ocean will be freezing, where the saltwater ocean will be freezing. 
um, during uh, the winter months so that you understand that, which is pretty important, I think, from an aeronautical perspective for what might happen in the emergency uh, should you have to ditch or, or something like that. So um, very kind of interesting. But step one in our flight planning there, we actually uh, used for the American portion, uh, we use FlyQ. We're a big fan of FlyQ, which works with the AeroNav products. Um, and then also Flight Plan Go, giving you access to some of this other data. Now, one point, Flight Plan Go has been acquired by Garmin Flight Plan, the company, has been acquired by Garmin in the interim. So I can't speak to what the future is of uh, the, the nature of this being free uh, uh, or what's available. I can just tell you, for the moment, it's a great piece of information to have anytime that you're flying to Canada or, um, or to some degree uh, beyond that, but certainly to Canada. And free information, let me tell you, from Canada is very, very difficult to come by. It's not like here in the United States, that's for sure. Um, so take a look at this. Uh, I'm not sure how that actually, little, little typo there, we'll fix that immediately. So let's take a look at what we've uh, at here. First, data and charting. Now, um, one of the things that was the most helpful parts of the process to us was the fact that the AeroNav systems using data from Jeppesen, uh, when you get the Canadian and North American data, it included Saint-Pierre and Miquelon, even though they are actually not part of what you would think of as is certainly not part of Canada, but they, imp they, they included the important parts for actual navigation. The identifier for Saint-Pierre is Foxtrot Lima Victor Papa, you see right there. And what matters about this is that all of your navigation equipment will work. It'll ha even, it has the approaches, it has the, uh, all of the nav aids, everything that you need uh, in this area, which is very um, sensitive to weather changes as you get north and east, um, everything is in there that you need for that. What is not there are the charts. And so there are three different segments here. The first is our electronic data. So we know we're okay for that. Our next step here is the charts on our EFB. We talked about FlyQ for the US and Southern Canada, Flight Plan Go for Canadian and France. What that then leaves are your actual charts and airport information for being able to actually fly an approach should you need to. Understand what you need to do for the airport, how it operates, hours of operation, services, all of the contact information. And the only way to get that is actually to communicate directly with uh, service information aeronautique at France, which means you're calling Paris and uh, you have to deal with both the phone calls and the language challenges and everything else along the way. But they did cooperate with us and they were um, nice enough to actually send us the information. They actually emailed us the, you know, the actual charts and information that we needed. And I'll tell you, it's, it's pretty comprehensive. Um, I'm sure that what they sent us and I believe what they communicated to us is that they were sending us the information they had as an air traffic control agency. But just for these two little islands, uh, which constitute two little airports, uh, one on Saint-Pierre and one on Miquelon, um, that was about 50 pages of information. Um, not all of it was that applicable to us, but uh, quite a bit of it was stuff that we actually had to go through to make sure that we could actually make it happen. happen. So that's as far as data and charting what you need to do, those three things and being able to communicate directly with France. Now, next step was fuel planning. So uh, first step, get as much fuel as you can in the United States because fuel is expensive in Canada. It was over $10 a gallon in this case uh, for us, uh, being able to fuel up in, in Sydney, which is what we did. Uh, and that seems remarkably cheap compared to Ile Saint-Pierre because there isn't any. So that you are making an overwater flight that um, is uh, depending on your winds and the speed of your aircraft, in our case, it was a little over an hour. And um, then, of course, you have to come back on the same tank of gas. There's no one there to help you. There's no barrels or anything else. So all of this has to be planned for in advance. The next thing is local planning. Um, the, uh, there 
is almost nothing on uh, Miquelon. That's a much, much larger island, but it only has 500 residents. And it's more of a, a nature tour for, or a day trip that people sometimes go to see. Really, uh, and what we went to and what we spent our time on was uh, Saint-Pierre, which is a, a thriving, enormous metropolitan area of uh, something like 5,000 residents. So uh, it's actually also extraordinarily small, but limited housing. There is about five places that you can stay. Um, and uh, with the exception of maybe one or two out of those five, they're pretty much bed and breakfast in people's homes. Uh, you, and you have to call and make those arrangements in advance and uh, do it as much in advance as you can because each of those has probably five rooms at most. So um, uh, good news, not very expensive to do. Um, bad news, uh, English is, is very difficult to come by there, and you do have to do it in advance if you want to do that. Now, they don't have a lot of visitors, so it's not like it's a huge tourist uh, spot, but important. Limited restaurants, uh, that is the same thing, although they are absolutely fantastic, and limited business hours. And these two things actually tie together. So restaurants, I'll give you a, kind of a, a story. We didn't do uh, any planning when it came to this. Uh, and so when we uh, arrived and went around, there were a few restaurants that looked great. Um, however, they informed us that all their uh, since we did not have a reservation, all their spots were full. And just before we left, the gentleman, the maitre d' uh, at the restaurant, uh, tried to communicate to us in um, my virtually non-existent French ability and his virtually non-existent English ability. Uh, he tried to communicate with us that, you know, could we, you know, uh, essentially with 30 minutes, um, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, would uh, one hour, be okay and we were my boys and I were there thinking like um, an hour like we were not going to eat tonight like of course we'd wait an hour for a table and it looked like as he was talking to me that um, he was really concerned about this like are you sure that an hour is acceptable and I kept saying back like yes one hour is absolutely acceptable and as we uh, as then we said yes he said yes and we turned to leave he then immediately kind of motioned over to a table and said, here you go. Well, so much for the hour wait. It took us a little bit to figure out what they were actually saying. What they were actually saying was, was it possible if they were willing to feed us for us to uh, suffer the absolute injustice in um, France of downing an entire meal from them in only one hour because they had this table reserved for someone else in one hour. And so what they were actually saying is, can you eat in an hour? And I tried to explain back, of course, we looked at that as Americans and said, like, can we eat in an hour? I don't think I've ever been in a restaurant with my kids for more than an hour. So, yeah, we're good to go. Um, the bottom line is there's a different way that everything is, happens. And the same thing with those business hours includes the fact that the entire island shuts down for two hours in the middle of the day, as is their custom, because everyone goes home for lunch. And so these are all things you need to plan for and understand, which if you happen to be more of a world traveler than I am, perhaps you're already well-versed in. Uh, the next thing, which is also very interesting, is to understand how phone networks work. When we are here in the United States, um, we don't really think about it. We think about it once when we go and we purchase our phone, we get a plan, we work with Verizon or AT&T or whoever you use. Well, that is not how it works in Canada, and it is not how it works in Saint-Pierre and Nicolas. And it goes up by an order of magnitude. The minute that you land in Canada, you often have a new feature that literally just opens up in the settings on your phone that you will not see in the United States. And that is a feature to select your network. And literally, you just Pick which network you want to be on at the time, just like you would what Wi-Fi you might want to be on. But in this case, it's actually a phone network. And while there were two when we landed in Canada, there were four or five on this tiny little island that we're on uh, of Saint-Pierre. And what we then learned after speaking to people and getting some guidance is 
it affects cost, it affects what's available. It's some of them you have data, some of them you have phones, some of them you have both. And so this is also something to look into and talk to your uh, cell phone carrier and make sure you understand what's covered under your plan and what isn't. But if you don't go into your phone and actually select uh, the, the right network, uh, it will limit what your ability is uh, to be able to communicate, which of course kind of matters quite a bit. Last part is, some here in alone are part of the European Union, and that means euros. Uh, and that's the, that, that is period, how they operate. So it's gonna be credit card and euros. Every once in a while, you may find uh, someone willing to uh, take a gob of American money uh, in exchange for a loaf of bread, but um, chances are you're not getting a very good deal when you do that. Okay, talk about international flight planning now. Uh, I'll take it in phases. The first part is your United States departure. Um, if you've ever uh, traveled uh, outside the United States, everything through customs is done on the EAPIS tool. Um, uh, first of all, you do need to actually uh, make sure uh, so that you can get back into the United States, that you actually have a pass um, from a custom sticker that you actually get uh, for your aircraft. That's not hard to get. And um, uh, even if you don't, even if it's kind of last minute, if you have the receipt for it, usually customs will be quite happy to say, well, the receipt's good enough. But you file your departure on EAPIS, which gives you a crossing point and tells them in advance who's on board, the passports, every, all the information for everybody that's on board, and when you will be exiting United States airspace. Um, and uh, you have to be on a flight plan, VFR or IFR flight plan, in order to depart the United States legally. That covers your exit, but coming into the next country of Canada, you have to coordinate with CAN Pass, which is the Canadian Customs Notice of Planned Arrival. Now, there are two different uh, features here, and, and the concept of CAN Pass can be a bit confusing. Um, you can actually call and give all the information and not have any type of a subscription or paid service or membership or anything like that to actually enter Canada using that. But there's also a can pass service that you can pay for that allows you to go to more airports, some that don't have customs on the field and do more things. Um, we don't do that, but uh, don't confuse the two. As long as you call them, in advance and give them information on everyone that's arriving, you will be set uh, to actually do that, but you have to have it done in, adv in advance. On arrival, you have to close your flight plan manually, and then you actually call CanPass again and report your arrival. 90 plus percent of the time, um, your arrival into Canada will, and your whole customs experience will be that one phone call, and the person on the other end saying, welcome to Canada, uh, as long as there weren't any changes in anything that uh, you told us about and people on board or anything you were doing, here's your confirmation number, you're all set to go. So you never even have to see anyone the vast majority of the time. Um, uh, I have had it happen a few times and uh, uh, it did actually happen on this trip, but not from the US, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and most importantly, now this is covering your Canadian things. So remember, we're doing multiple countries. So now we've covered our US departure, we've covered our Canadian arrival. Now we've got to go to the next step. Now we have to depart Canada for France. There's a lot more involved in this one. And all of this has to be planned before you leave the United States, because of course we're doing this as one trip, but we're looking at it as these separate phases. So from Canada, the Canadian Flight Service, you actually have to have a BFR or IFR flight plan to fly from Canada to France. Um, you then need to have with CanPass, their customs, your notice of planned departure. Same thing, very easy to do. But here's where it gets a little more complicated. Now you have to start dealing with how you are going to arrive in Saint-Pierre which is basically France. Now there's things like phone numbers here. And remember that this video is going to be available on YouTube where you can go and pause it and write down anything that you want in the future. But it starts with 
how are you going to make your arrival happen? Well, when you are dealing with um, uh, two islands, one of which has 500 people and one of which only has 5,000 people, you don't have an airport that is uh, fully staffed and running all of the time. So uh, the same is true of customs. It's a beautiful airport, but it's a ghost town for most of the time. And so literally, the customs personnel and the tower personnel will come to the airport from their home, open up the airport and be there for you, only if you call and make an advanced <laughs> appointment with them to do so. That's a pretty big deal. And so we made had to make several calls um, and uh, get some help from, usually most of it involved me talking to someone on the phone who talked to someone's cousin who spoke both French and English, who then talked to the right person who was standing next to them who actually controlled everything. Um, but through all of those communication channels, the bottom line was you. we had to make sure that customs was coming in uh, as well as their uh, Euro control staff to be able to man the tower and everyone was there for our arrival. There is uh, an airline service, Air Saint-Pierre, that's at the airport there. They have two planes. Um, uh, um, one, I think, is a de, de Havilland, uh, um, and one is, uh, 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 I'm pretty sure one is that, or a Saab, and the other one is a Cessna um, uh, twin. And they don't run all the time, so they have, you know, not even, I'm not even sure if they have one flight a day. So it was uh, very important for us to make these arrangements, make sure everyone was going to be there and understand that they were ready and, and take care of all this. So all of this takes place. Uh, during this stage, they're very, very nice and kind. And here's the most important part. There are no fees for this. There are fees when you actually use Canadian services over in the Canadian portion, but there were no fees um, for air traffic control customs, all the other things that were involved in coming into uh, Saint-Pierre and essentially France. That All that work that we did in that first step and the, the number of phone calls to make sure that we were going to be there at the right time and that someone was going to come and essentially open the airport resulted in uh, them putting their, this into their elaborate system, which was the notebook you see to your right. Turns out that was pretty much what got written down uh, to allow us to arrive. So once you arrive in France, First of all, close flight plan. The tower will actually do that for you. They do, uh, uh, fortunately, speak English in the tower, um, and they will close your flight plan. And then also French customs and French immigration. Uh, that one call that we made in the beginning covered both of those services, but they are separate organizations. And so we, have, once we arrived, literally dealt with three different uh, staff people. I think it was actually five different people that arrived for our little plane um, and helped process us in, uh, which was very, very, very cool. And that then takes you to the arrival there. This was actually what it was. Now, um, we've got a video at the end, which is very cool. We'll teach you some more uh, and show you some more about it. One of the really, really cool things that did happen for us when we actually arrived was um, uh, it, at the time that we had landed, and as soon as we cleared uh, customs uh, and uh, immigration of the French side uh, of entry, um, the, we, it just happened to coincide that the tower had to wait for someone, I think it was either transitioning their airspace or a departure or arrival that was happening that they were dealing with, and the gentleman in the tower just was one guy and the only way for us to actually get off the airport at that point was to wait for him to to finish up there and so he this this really really wonderful great guy uh invited us up to the tower and said would you mind to talk to us literally on the radio and said hey after you park and you finish with everybody there would you like to come up to the, the top of the tower here and, and hang out with me while i finish this flight and i can't let you out until after that well, as pilots, we certainly like to visit the tower and see all that. So we got this really uh, wonderful tour with this gentleman named Paul who showed us uh, uh, all around the tower and, and how everything works and um, 
very very cool, and there'll be some video of that uh, when we uh, when we get to that moving forward. So, what happens when it's time to leave? Same thing. You have to work with the tower. They have to come in. You work with tower customs and security to have everybody come for uh, to see you off, and uh, you file your VFR and IFR flight plan. Now, fortunately. At least you can do that actually through Canada. You don't actually do that through uh, the uh, um, Euro control. And that allows you to file everything. And then with CanPass, you are now filing uh, an arrival just like when you were coming out of the United States. Um, and then when it comes to your arrival, you get into Canada, you close your flight plan, CanPass notice of arrival, and uh, note that number. Now. What was very interesting in this case is for the first time in all the times I've ever flown into Canada, I actually saw for the first time Canadian customs people. And what was really interesting is they came out to our aircraft when we landed in Sydney, Nova Scotia, coming out of Ile Saint Pierre. And they came out there because we were arriving from the European Union legally. And that's different. And so therefore that caused them to come out. Now they came out and didn't really do much other than say hi, but um, it was uh, it was kind of interesting to actually see them for the first time. Last step in this was the concept of coming home. Now, here's where things get a little bit more complex uh, along the way. So, um, coming out of the United States, easy. Dealing with Canadian customs, easy. Turns out dealing with uh, the French uh, customs, uh, uh, easy. Coming back in the United States is always a little bit of a challenge. Um, and there's a few things that uh, that you need to know. First of all, of course, you do need to be on a VFR or IFR flight plan. You do need to go on EAPIS and file your notice of planned arrival uh, back into the country there. That's not too hard to do as well. I mentioned earlier, you need to make sure that you have a customs sticker available on your aircraft that you've gone and you've bought it. It's like $25 or $29 uh, for a year. Uh, for that sticker. If you didn't do it in time, you can just bring them the receipt. If it hasn't arrived yet, that's no problem. But the key about coming back in is things have changed over the past 10, 15 years that I've been uh, doing any type of travel between the United States and Canada. And what has changed is it's become very complicated about uh, what airport of what the differences are between different airports of entry back into the United States. So when you're coming in, you have to land at an airport of entry. And I strongly recommend that you do not just go with whatever's listed on the website or anywhere else that you do your research. You actually call that wherever you plan to arrive and speak to the local U.S. customs agent at that location to find out how it works because it has, again, become quite complicated. Sometimes a lot of the information I've come across online is incorrect about their hours of service. And if you get there and they are not uh, actually open, even if it says it online, you are in trouble. There are lots of ways to get into trouble coming back into the United States. That's one of them. The other thing has to do with fees. Uh, you can go to some airports and there will be no fee. You go to other airports and the even though there isn't a fee from customs, there will be a fee from the airport. And that's important to know because some uh, airports have, and, and airport communities have started levying fees to the customs uh, uh, processing that takes place there. Very important and those fees can be dramatic. In some cases, it can be in the hundreds of dollars if it is an off hours, for example, near near me, if you come in over a weekend or something like that, there is an airport right near here, Hanscom, Bedford, Massachusetts, that um, off hours, customs won't even say anything to you. They will simply say, yeah, sure, we'll be there at that time, and then you'll get a $350 fee. So big differences between that and free. And then the last thing is that there are some airports now where the customs on the airport is by advance coordination and permission only. And again, that is not written anywhere that I have easily found to identify. I only found that by calling. What that means is that you need to call the local agent, the EAPIS that you file online, that gives you legal permission 
and advance notice to customs doesn't cover your actual permission to land at that airport. That actual permission comes from the local agent that you have to do. And so that's pretty important, which then goes to your next step here. Number one, remain inside the aircraft. Um, they don't like it if you violate this, which can be very difficult because sometimes they forget about you and you sit in the aircraft for quite a while and there's no horn on a plane, so it's kind of hard to tap the horn. I did make the mistake once coming in of popping out uh, after waiting for a while in a hot plane, walking in, finding a guy reading a magazine who then um, decided that uh, he had forgotten about us, but instead of saying, oops, I forgot about you, he said, you were not supposed to get out of your airplane and um, wasn't too happy about that, so we worked that out for a little bit. Um, close your flight plan. And here's the thing, they have changed quite a bit what they want to see now. They now need to see your passports, your pilot's certificate, your medical, which is fairly new that they want to see that, and your aircraft registration. And even they are not really used to dealing with this because they spent probably 15 minutes trying to find a a, 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 uh, I guess a document number or a serial number on the medical because their form requires them to take something and there's actually no place for it. So anyway, interesting stuff having to do with that. You wait there, fun, interrogations, etc. Let's talk about avionics management. This is our panel, primary flight display we've got here. Hazard. We have the uh, Avidine version of the Aeronav 900 and 800 and the iPad, and this is exactly how we actually kind of manage our flight and we go. Now, how do we actually use that? This is a good kind of picture showing you as we kind of go in here a little bit about it. First of all, as we said, it's a dual setup. Our main navigation with map overview allows us to get information uh, right in front, as you see, of L, um, it's a Foxtrot vector PAPA, and it's actually showing you step down as we come in here. Um, the next is flight plan information, airport and text information, which is what we use the 800 for below it. Um, the Jepson data gives you mapping, airport information, and approaches. And the key features as to why these were so amazingly helpful to us during our flight had to do with, first of all, those altitude step downs. You're spending, uh, in many cases, uh, again, depending on the speed of your aircraft, over an hour out of sight of land. You want to be at, you know, at, the, at an altitude that's efficient for your aircraft. Beyond a certain amount of altitude, it really kind of doesn't matter because you're not within gliding distance. You just want enough time to solve a problem and or prepare for an emergency ditching. We'll talk safety at the end of this presentation. Um, but the AeroNav systems have really, really great vertical speed planning. You can see VSR there on your right, which allows you to plan for that and flight plan management. GPS and radio navigation, because you're going to need that as well en route. Uh, both parts of it, because again, depending on what approaches and what guidance that you're doing, when you transition from Canadian control to uh, Euro control, um, they uh, may give you radio navigation uh, approaches, which is much of the information that was in the packet from uh, the French aeronautical community. Um, frequencies, including standby monitoring on route local, that's, an, that's one of the most, uh, really one of the coolest things about these systems, about the AeroNav 900 and 800. If you look on the, on the um, 900 there in the center, there are three frequencies there. And when we think about it en route, we are managing uh, both local, we're trying to get information, we're listening to other aircraft, we've got guard going at the same time, one to 1.5. And what's great about this is that you can have on that one unit three different frequencies, and you can even monitor uh, one of them in the standby aside from whatever your audio panel can do. That's just what's built in to the actual AeroNav itself. So you can have three frequencies uh, and monitor a standby at the same time using the unit. So between this, we were able to juggle five different frequencies between these two units uh, en route, and we used them. And so that's a really, really good benefit, in my opinion, of it. Now, en route, we happen to have active traffic because you'll see uh, no TISB, and that's right there on the map. Uh, Canada does not have ADSB uh, UAT version, 
so you do not have weather or traffic uh, coming in uh, directly through that. Now, they do have the traffic side if you have um, that through Canada, but you're not going to have it during the overwater portion of your flight. That's the key distinction uh, in doing that. Uh, planning for alternates, fuel management is great in these. It gives you terrain, and it did automatic time zone management because we flew across, uh, I guess during this was two or three different time zones to get there. So um, uh, big, big difference uh, as far as that, and was extremely, extremely helpful en route. So with that, I would like to hand over a few slides here to Stephen, and then what we're going to do is uh, Stephen's going to review the product uh, itself and go into some of the details of these units that we love so much, and then we'll come back. I've got a video, which is kind of cool, about this trip, and we'll talk about safety, of course, which is one of the most important things if you're going to do an adventure like this. So how are you doing, Stephen? Doing very well. So um, I have the pleasure to talk about the less exciting stuff here, um, but exciting nonetheless. Um, but we're going to just kind of walk through a general overview of the Aeronav units, um, kind of some of their interfaces, some of their functionality, and how we can use that. And Jeff has all done a great job on touching upon this. So we'll make sure that this is quick so we can get you to that video um, for the exciting finish here. Um, one thing that is important to note with these Aeronav units is the, the customization that you can do for their displays. And um, Jeff talked about that managing some of your frequencies, but another big piece of that is just your data blocks in general. What information do you want to see when you're on the map page? Do you need your um, time to destination, estimated time and route, your altitude, things along those lines? You can make essentially all those data blocks customized to how you're flying, what segment of the flight that you are in, and how you just kind of want to manage your airplane in general. And so that's a big piece of kind of the the overview of what I wanted to talk about when it comes to the customization. One key feature also is the, the tab page philosophy um, of these. So there's no nested menus or anything like that, no home screen that you have to go back to to get to different apps. All of your control of this unit can be done through the bezel buttons and the touch screen itself. Um, something that's important to note is the tactile feedback and what you can do with the rocker switches at the bottom. So I hate to say it, but uh, when I was actually first playing with the Avidyne uh, units um, before we even white labeled them, it took me uh, a hot minute to realize that those bezel buttons at the bottom weren't actually just indent buttons. They're actually rocker switches, which allows you to go through um, all the pages, whether or not it's the FMS, the map page, the auxiliary page, you can tab through all those pages with the rocker switches, at them, which I think is a really, really cool feature of the Aeronav units. Um, and so just kind of moving on um, out of the intuitive operation to this, um, Jeff, yeah, is the, the navigation and how you can flight plan uh, with the unit itself. Um, the biggest thing that I think is uh, important to note is the predictive flight planning or the, the geofill um, piece there. So rather than predicting anything based on alphabetics or anything along those lines, it's gonna predict waypoints based on GPS location which is a pretty interesting way to go about it. So if you are close to an airport and you have some in and around that airport and you dial in, let's say, the first first letter of that and you have, let's say, a rattlesnake VOR, which is close to Albuquerque, which is where I'm based out of, uh, which is RSK. I'm going to be in Albuquerque and I'm going to turn that knob to R and it's going to autofill SK in there because it realizes that it's picking up that geofill. And so it autofills that, and I can look, verify, hit enter, boom, we're done. That is a huge time saving piece when it comes to entering complex flight plans or anything along those lines. Now, 
Another piece of that kind of customization that you can do to that is just decluttering, uh, removing some of the pieces of the map um, to show critical flight information based on your phases of flight. I, Jeff was actually the person who turned me um, onto this kind of way of operating these units, but the fact of uh, using those decluttering features and map features during your phases of flight, during critical phases, takeoff, landing, make sure that you just have your necessary information and maybe some of the additional information that's not as critical but nice for situational awareness doesn't need to be on there necessarily. So that's a nice way of being able to kind of coordinate the units in regards to the actual flight planning themselves. And then obviously if you don't have TAWS on board your airplane already, um, the FLTA or Forward Looking Terrain Avoidance is uh, TAWS-like uh, announcements that give you nice terrain callouts and uh, general kind of terrain awareness uh, when you are flying along. So it is not a certified TAS. So if you are required to have TAS in your airplane, it's not going to replace that. Um, but for us who don't need TAS in their airplane, it is a great option to enhance some of your situational awareness. Now that is something that is standard on the AeroNav units, uh, just to keep in mind. And then all the units do have a, a synthetic vision. Um, they all come with an entrail synthetic vision, so kind of um, up off the tail uh, of the airplane, which gives you a nice view. The flagship unit, however, which is the AeroNav 910, does have an internal AHAR system, and that's going to bring up a dedicated synthetic vision, which has a compass rose and is going to be an out-the-window view. Uh, which when you are flying, um, having that additional situational awareness is nice. It is more expensive than the other units, um, but if you are willing to, you know, pony up the extra three grand, I do believe, to have that super nice synthetic vision, it is 100% worth it. Um, absolutely. So um, that kind of walks through a little bit of some of the navigation and we already have here showing um, that we were showing some of the additional frequencies. Jeff did a great job of kind of explaining how to properly use additional frequencies rather than just having them there um, to deal with, um, but actually using them for a flight management point of view, which I think is a, a great way to uh, utilize that feature. Now, one key part about the AeroNav units is the ability to control almost anything from the bezel buttons and the touch screen. Now, obviously functions like pinch to zoom and things like that are dedicated touch screen. Now you can zoom in and out using the uh, knobs on either side, but that pinch to zoom is one of those features that is gonna be dedicated touch screen, but majority of your critical flight features whether or not you're bouncing around like you're a kid on trampoline going through turbulence, you're going to be able to anchor your hand on something and make sure your flight is headed in the correct direction um, based on GPS or anything like that that's going to be required for that. And that's just that combination of the bezel buttons and those knobs. Um, when you are on the flight planning screen, actually, the right knob, you can enter an entire flight plan without letting your fingers off that knob. Just turn top or bottom piece of that indent and you just off to the races. Um, and with a little bit of practice, you can enter a pretty, uh, pretty big flight plan, um, probably in under a minute, uh, just using that knob, which is amazing. And I think that's a really neat feature uh, once you get used to the units. Uh, for flight planning. Now, we did just talk about this synthetic vision, and here is a great view of what that out the window synthetic vision um, looks like. And like I said, when it comes to enhancing that situational awareness, having an idea of where that terrain is in regards to your aircraft is huge when you have the out the window view you are gonna see that terrain shaded yellow and red depending on where that is in regards to your aircraft. Yellow, that's kind of your caution zone. 
you're close, but you're going to make it. Red means you're going to fly into a mountain or something else as bad is going to happen. So when we talk about managing um, your performance, especially in mountainous terrain and looking at where that is kind of going, that's going to be a big piece of that sort of management. And that's just terrain and obstacle avoidance. Another cool feature um, when you are looking through this and the other synthetic vision, the in-trail version, is you are going to see METAR flags. Um, so if you are planning internet and maybe your first airport is looking a little hairy on whether or not you're going to get down through the clouds, if you're flying IFR, um, METAR flags are a great way to kind of gauge, well, maybe I'm going to need to go somewhere a little different. What are the ceilings here? What are the ceilings over here at some other alternates. So once again, just a situational awareness and kind of flight planning uh, is huge. And that's ultimately what these units lead to is just a great flexibility for what they're able to do in terms of anything, um, flight planning, en route, on the ground, landing, takeoff, everything is uh, just very flexible when it comes to these units. Thanks so much, Stephen. That's, uh, you know, I, again, I, I, we're, we're obviously partners with Bendix King, but uh, I very sincerely am such a fan of using these units. I fly with them IFR, I fly with them in very challenging circumstances. And, you know, the most important thing is you never want to be in a situation where you're behind your avionics, meaning like you're trying to figure out what's it doing or how do I handle this complex routing that just came in. And we had to deal with that during this trip to St. Pierre. Um, you know, we, our first leg, we went to, uh, first we went to, uh, Eastport, Maine and Eastport, Maine, meaning the last airport right on the border had cheap gas, everything else it was good. Great launching off point. We had to go IFR to get there. We had to go IFR to our next step of Sydney using, uh, when, during that part of the trip, all in Canadian airspace. And as you know, we're getting handed routings, we're getting handed, um, uh, different things with airways and the aeronav units just you, you just start to put it in it automatically figures out what the nearest one is it guesses at what you're trying to do which just skips ahead so fast on the number of steps you have to do on anything and jumping on and off airways it's just it's just intuitive i never feel like i'm trying to catch up or trying to maintain more currency on my avionics and that's really really important and was critical to our flight uh and 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 our safety on route which really brings us up to this slide about safety because it really does matter a lot and when you are over water for an extended period of time when you're dealing with um the atlantic when you're dealing which is cold when you're dealing with areas where you don't have a lot of other things that are going to come and get you really quickly you need to think about safety. So first of all, life draft, life vest, strobes, flashlights, all the things that you need, this is not a nice to have. This is absolutely critical if you're gonna make a journey like this. Um, and in addition to that, food and water. The next thing is position reporting, which in many cases is air to air. And we heard them, you know, they would lose contact with different aircraft en route because of the reception issues over uh, longer distances. Um, over water and so you end up relaying in normal operations sometimes from one aircraft to another to uh, help them communicate or someone helps you communicate and don't be uh, you know don't don't hesitate to even make sure that you're in contact if you haven't heard from a while or to actually you know use another aircraft that you hear to just relay a message if you feel like you can't reach someone it's it's pretty important to to do that and to understand where you are relative to other traffic because again you are outside of radar coverage for the vast majority of what you're doing at least during the the overwater portion next thing that's really important breathing and training your crew and passengers it is very Im Im important you know you don't want to try to explain to people not to inflate a raft inside of an airplane um, at, at when you need to use it uh, they need to understand how these things work. They need to understand how everything works and exactly whose job is what if something are to happen. And whereas normally when you're traveling, you're actually looking and maybe planning a route that gives you, keeps you in gliding distance to airports or something like that. In this case, it's pretty important to look for ships. 
um, because they are going to be your safest form of rescue over um, over the ocean. Um, they are going to be the nearest thing. So if you can keep an eye out at all times and try to see where a ship would be, where you would kind of glide to, and how you would do that, you would actually describe that in an emergency air traffic control in addition to your location. Um, obviously, look for traffic. And then next one, brief the flight, the charts, and the terrain all the way en route. Um, so uh, one uh, more thing, what we're going to do now, we're going to actually play a, a short a little video. So after being over the water for over an hour, all of a sudden this island appears out of nowhere and it's absolutely stunning. The airport's along the southern shore and the buildings are so colorful. You get to see this just as this idyllic setting. It, it, it really is amazing. It was a difficult approach. We had winds gusting 19 to 28 and it was about 50 to 40, 50 degrees to our right. So really, really gusty and difficult to stay on the center line. But we got as close as we could and were able to uh, touch down safely. And uh, then what's really, really interesting is uh, they assign you a very specific uh, ta uh, place to taxi to and a tie down spot that has a letter and a number. And you just follow the lines and it literally tells you for each letter and each number where to go and park. I've never seen anything as organized as this before. Finally, after shutting down and getting rid of the white knuckles of the landing, we're able to uh, uh, disembark and uh, uh, put the flaps up and start unloading all of our gear. Um, we use these folding bikes by a company called DownTube, D-O-W-N-T-U-B-E, and they're remarkably inexpensive and light and very, very easy to, uh, uh, to take with us. It really is... Um, uh, great, and, and it lets us do everything. Now, after we landed, we were invited up to the control tower, as we talked about. Really so cool. This uh, gentleman who is the flight controller there for Euro Control, because it's France, his name is Paul, showed us everything about how this tower works, how all the systems work, how flights are handed off. Ben even got to work a flight from Gander. It was really, really cool, and he printed out uh, the ticket for us. So afterwards, we are off to explore St. Pierre on our bikes, and it is just a wonderful place. If you are into the outdoors, if you like biking and exploring, um, this is really something that has to be on your bucket list. It, it's, it's not a big place, but it is amazing in terms of the beauty and the landscapes. Um, truly, truly, uh, uh, you know, breathtaking. You climb up to some of these vistas and you can just see forever. And uh, along much of the, the coastal area, they also have these paths that are built uh, out of wood that you uh, can walk or ride your bike on like this and explore uh, all sorts of areas that were too marshy to just walk on. So we did a lot of exploring, some resting along the way, and um, really made a, a kind of a lifelong adventure. And you can't say enough there about the food, although um, it's not a good place to go swimming because of the cold there, as you see from that. But back to the food. Food was unbelievable. Um, just spectacular what you would expect if you were in France, which, of course, there you are. So uh, with that great adventure done, uh, it was time to go home. Uh, still blustery winds on our way back out. We had a, a, a really nice calm day in between, um, but then it was time to pack everything up. And so uh, with that, we have to deal with control from St. Pierre release and customs and security, and then um, transfer from uh, Euro control to um, uh, through St. Pierre over to um, our overwater flight, which is controlled out of uh, Sydney and with uh, uh, Can Canadian airspace control, and work our way all the way back home to Minuteman Airport, where we're based in Stowe, Massachusetts. Um, it's amazing also the climate difference. When we got home, it was a dramatically different in terms of temperature, and um, it, it felt like a world away. Next year, we have some really uh, interesting adventures planned as well. We hope to share those with you. 
uh, and hopefully have some more really great stories and other places that we can recommend that you go uh, and add to your bucket list. Okay, so um, hopefully I'll give you a little bit of a taste of what's involved. If you have any chance at all of being able to do an adventure like uh, uh, like this and get uh, get out to some Pierre and Nicolon, I'll tell you, you know, being being there, uh, it, it is fascinating uh, because so much of it, it, it basically, you are in you are in France. The cars are French. Everything. Is, is French there. It's amazing that just because of the import laws and everything else that happens and the fact that it is that, that legal portion, it's a great way to have an adventure that's certainly something out of the norm. Now, we had a couple of questions. One of them that came in had to do with uh, actually uh, insurance and liability coverage. Um, when we did check, we were told that we were, we were covered. They kind of made this exemption um, of saying, yeah, it's, uh, it's the European Union, but uh, you know we're still going to include it under your Canadian, you know, uh, allowed because we still understand kind of where it is. So that was kind of interesting. The same was actually true, to be honest, on our um, on our phone plan, where even though they switched over, they had this one exemption for these two islands, uh, probably because of geographically they understand that. Another question that came in had to do with is an NDB necessary, and the answer is. Um, well, what is necessary based on the uh, on what we had planned for approaches is the ability to have a DME, which we were able to qualify through because we have lost GPS. So, um, it, you know, the answer to that is it depends on what you're going to, what approaches you're going to be capable of doing. Definitely check out the approach charts there. They are very different uh, than what we are used to seeing in our traditional IFR approach charts. Um, the ones that, that are Euro control, the ones that are French approach charts, really look different. And I had to figure out a few things about them. I actually had to ask some questions of, uh, of people who um, were kind of <laughs> my friends and experts in the industry of like, hey, what, uh, where is this measured from? Where are they getting this DME and how would I dial this in? And so it, it's kind of interesting, but it's a, it's a fascinating thing to um, uh, to look into. And so with that, we are uh, out of time now. I really appreciate everyone taking your time today. I hope you have a wonderful holiday season coming up, and thank you so much for doing that. Um, and, of course, please check out Social Flight. Everything is free there, and our mission is to get you on adventures like this to get you out and flying, see all of the tens of thousands of things happening around you, and, of course, getting up there and enjoying the blue skies. With that, thank you so much. Good night.